it became a, an absolute nightmare for the Springboks, who there probably are eight, nine times out of ten a better team than England by 10, 12 points at least. This was the one game when it didn't work out. When England's game plan worked and we saw them expend a huge amount of physical energy um, in the quarterfinal, I think psychologically and mentally it was a big ask for them to, to, to fight back and win the semi-final. So in terms of who's in better shape, I, I think the answer is definitely New Zealand, but I've been, I've played against and I've watched the Springboks for, for quite a time and you don't write them off. But New Zealand have uh, the prep, prep, preparatory edge going into the game. Hello, I'm Nick Ellaby from Times Radio here with our weekly look at the Rugby Union World Cup. Finally, we're down to just two teams, New Zealand and South Africa. We'll look how they got there and take a look at the final as well this weekend. Here with me is one of the Times' brilliant writers and also England, Bath, Bristol and Newport fly half extraordinaire Stuart Barnes. Hey Stuart, how are you doing? Very well, Nick, thank you. Good. OK, so getting straight to it, after last week's quarterfinals, there was a sense that we could have seen the games which would decide the final and this weekend would just be a formality. We got one out of two of those, didn't we, Stuart? What did you read into the first of those semi-finals on Saturday night? Well, that was very much as we expected. Um, the quarterfinals, you know, in Paris were the four big guns, uh, New Zealand, Ireland, France and South Africa. Uh, the quarterfinals in Marseille, um, were the underdogs, England, Argentina, um, Wales and Fiji. And so it proved. New Zealand were far too strong for them. Um, it was a really disappointing game in many ways um, because New Zealand were able to win in third gear. If I was born in, um, in Dunedin or Wellington or Auckland, I'd be delighted because New Zealand now can march on to the final um, without really having expended much energy at all in that semi-final after what had been a bruising quarter-final against Ireland. So it's worked beautifully for New Zealand. Um, they've shown just how good they can be with the ball in hand and on the counter-attack. The scrum's looking good. They're in A1 shape. Do you think France let themselves down at home? No, not, not at all. Not at all. I, I think the French game against South Africa was one of the great games of all time. And if they played tomorrow, there's no reason to think France wouldn't have nicked it by four points or, or five points. It was that sort of game. Yeah. Um, uh, n no criticism at all of Ireland or France. Uh, they just lost uh, in the way quarterfinals go. Uh, but it took two very fine teams to beat the two European sides. And we'll come back to uh, South Africa and England in a bit, but there's been a lot of criticism of New Zealand coming into these knockouts. I mean, they lost to France in the opener, hailed as the weakest All Blacks team maybe ever at a World Cup. Then they beat, you know, the favourites at the time, Ireland, one of the great performances. Do you think this New Zealand team has turned a corner in this tournament? It's hard to say. I mean, I, I, I thought that, before this tournament started, I, I described it as, as thus. Ireland, South Africa and France, I thought, were three great teams and one of them would win the World Cup. As for New Zealand, I thought they were a team capable on their day of beating anyone because of the quality of their players and, and the nature of their game, their understanding of how to play counter-attack rugby. Um They've had that win against Ireland. So now, you know, Argentina was quite easy. They lost to France. So th the moment is upon us now. Um, and brilliant as they were um, in the quarterfinals, as slick as they looked when they had to in the semifinals, uh, it's going to be a very different final. And just because South Africa uh, in the wind and rain really seemed a couple of gears uh, off their best you know they look tired after the French game that does not mean that there will be a replication South Africa have got to find a way to stop New Zealand turning over the ball um, but we saw when the two teams met at Twickenham and, and South Africa uh, put a record margin upon the All Blacks uh, they are capable because they're very physical and the test will be whether New Zealand can withstand the power of the box. And who do you think is coming into this final in sort of better shape in terms of New Zealand have actually had a bit of an easier run. 
but South Africa have been tested and have come through those mm. tests. So how do you think that's going to set the teams up for the final? Um, I think New Zealand are in ideal shape. They've had the, they've had two hard games. They lost one, learnt some lessons, and they won the next. Uh, Argentina could have been tricky, was never really going to be. So I, I think they're in um, great shape. They couldn't hope to be anywhere better. South Africa, it is a bit different because uh, France, um, I think, was even more physical than the Ireland game. And then uh, their semi-final is exactly what they didn't want. Uh, England uh, able to slow it down, to strangle the game because of the conditions. And it became uh, an absolute nightmare for the Springboks, who there probably are eight, nine times out of ten a better team than England by 10, 12 points at least. This was the one game when it didn't work out, when England's game plan worked and we saw them expend a huge amount of physical energy um, in the quarterfinal. I think psychologically and mentally it was a big ask for them to, to, to fight back and win the semi-final. So in terms of who's in better shape, I, I think the answer is definitely New Zealand, but I've been, I've played against and I've watched the Springboks for, for quite a time and you don't write them off. But New Zealand have uh, the pre pre preparatory edge going into the game. Right, interesting that. So, you know, just finally on, on New Zealand, I mean, obviously they're the underdog slightly, which is a strange position for them, but do you think they've got a good shout? Can they put in another 80 minutes like they did against Ireland? Uh, the, the, they're not underdogs in my book at the moment. I've, I've had, I've had the the the, the danger, uh, and the island win didn't surprise me, but South Africa now um, have been battered, and they've got a great squad, but it's going to test them all the way. I won't dismiss South Africa, um, but I think because of the run up, um, not so much how they're playing, just the run up into the game. Um, I would make New Zealand marginal favourites now for the for the final. Interesting stuff. You heard it here first. Oh, we need to talk about the draw as well. I mean, people have been talking about it for months, yeah. well in through to the tournament, um, held three years ago. Do you think World Rugby need to make some changes? And, and will they? Got to learn their lessons. Um, World Rugby has, has not been fast to act in the past in, in, in various departments, but this one's so, so obvious. Um, how you do in your World Cup isn't enough to give you an advantage in seeding because what we've got, it's World Cup performance plus the first year outside the World Cup. So you're basically saying the World Cup and the cycle after it. So the same team can be doing that. Uh, a team like South Africa, for example, and France were evolving on a very different scale. So they get to the World Cup in, in top condition and, and Ireland. Uh, whereas teams like uh, England, shall we say, who got to the final, they put everything into the final, getting there in Japan. Uh, and they expended so much that we've seen them for three years, four years afterwards, they've really struggled. So you got this lopsided thing. Because they got the final, England were, one, were, were in a great position to become one of the top seeds. That now has to change. I don't think... Um, other than winning the World Cup, you should be a, a top seed. Uh, and I think the other thing that counts is instead of a, a, a three-year gap after the seeding has been agreed, it has to be two years. You have to you have to give uh, teams. You can't go too far. You've got to enable teams to find out where they're going to stay. Uh, the hospitality business is pretty big, and fans and travel companies have got to work out where their teams are. But one year after the World Cup, it is ridiculous. Two years uh, is not ideal, but it makes a lot more sense. In an ideal world, you'd say three years and the last year, fine, we know. But I think two is a, is a compromise that World Rugby should be able to reach. You say they should be able to reach. Can you see them changing their minds? Yeah. I, um, I mean, historically, they're slow to do things. Historically, rugby is very slow. It's very conservative. Um but it would not surprise me if World Rugby, uh, they, they've taken a vast amount of flack uh, from all forms of media, um, social media online as well. You know, the, the way this ended up with the four best teams playing each other in the quarterfinals, 
Uh, they will not want that again. It, in the end, we had an epic quarterfinal uh, weekend. We had um, an amazing match between England and South Africa, but that was one where the conditions helped so much. And another semi-final that was that was done and dusted before kickoff. We've got to a, one of the finals we should have two of the four best teams. Um, but, you know, I, I think world rugby has got to be careful. It can't have one to four at one side of the pool, five to eight the other. And are the flying Fijians making the quarterfinals, uh, do they sweeten that deal a little bit? Because, uh, you know, for me, they're like the, the the Pakistan of cricket or Brazil in football. They're the team that all the neutrals like to watch as well. Pakistan. I was watching Afghanistan give them a hide in yesterday in the World Cup. Well, they're volatile, <laughs> aren't they? That's why they're so fascinating. Yeah, yes, that's true. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of Brazil either. I think. Don't you think they're a bunch of divers now? Neymar just really turns my stomach a bit. He's such a good footballer. But given that aside, uh, yeah, we everyone loves Fiji, but Fiji now are in, interestingly in a in a state of flux because. Um, they worked very hard this World Cup on sorting out their scrum and their breakdown and actually a little bit of the uh, Fijian magic um, disappeared. They gave England a great game, but England are not a good team. Um, they struggled against Wales until they um, came off the lease and then they were brilliant. Uh, and the Aussie game, they play very European rugby. So Fiji now... Uh, I'm watching Fiji. I, I, I sort of want to see Fiji solidify their set piece. I mean, their, their line out was, a, was cost them possibly the, the quarter final. So I want to see them do that. But I don't want to see Fiji lose that unique characteristic that makes you say what you've just said about Fiji and makes so many rugby fans want that. So Fiji in the in the next four years are fascinating. They've got to get games. They've got to play more often against the the bigger guns. Um, but it's how they play those games that is going to be so intriguing. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we, we've got to go there as well. I feel like England and, and the other teams have to make a make an effort to get out there and, and play them on their patch. Um, back to that final and, and looking at the semi finals as well. Coming into the final, you wrote Argentina were more likely to pull off the upset than England. You said England yeah, like, England are a better the team than the Pumas, right? But also you said having to face South Africa in the semis was maybe more formidable. But now you're talking about New Zealand as the favourite. So has your opinion changed? And when did that opinion shift, if it has? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, I said that Argentina were more likely, but I didn't suggest that either were going to win. And sure, England almost almost won the game. Um, but I... What I didn't do was check the long, long, the long-term weather forecast in Paris, uh, and that was the error I made. Um, no, uh, you know, New Zealand uh, beat Argentina with consummate ease, but you know, I was waiting for the Argentinian fans to generate some atmosphere. I was, and, and, and I was also thinking that if Argentina get a, a seven, ten-point start, New Zealand do have a capacity. Uh, to get twitchy and to rush their game. And that didn't happen. Now, it could happen that South Africa will do that, which will change the way New Zealand look, the way they play, quite possibly. Um, as for South Africa, I did not envisage, envisage uh, an 80-minute deluge. And I did write in that piece what we didn't know. Uh, the, the great unknown was the impact of two great quarterfinals. And I think the uh, French match took a lot out of South Africa, uh, more than the Irish game took out of New Zealand. And, and you can you combine that with the conditions and it gave England that one in eight, one in nine chance of pulling off a, an amazing shock. Right. When you talk about that shock, you also wrote an England victory over South Africa here would have eclipsed their 2003 World Cup final triumph against Australia. Uh, the drop goal that we all know and love as their finest performance. They came so close in Paris, didn't they, Stuart? Yeah, they did. Um, but was it their finest performance? No, I, I think I was. The near, that's the nearest I get to patriotic. Um, they came amazingly close uh, in terms of commitment, in terms of Borthwick's game plan. Things couldn't have worked better, but game plans do not work 90%. Uh, 95% of the time. And in the end, the reality is 
uh, the, like I say, the, the rain was massive. The South Africans were down on their game. But had that been, and, and this, uh, had that game been in Autumn International at Twickenham, England's fans would have gone away and they said, blimey, that's the sixth straight game we've played where we haven't played very well. It's not been exciting. Um, we shouldn't confuse a really gutsy effort and a well thought out game plan uh, with uh, uh, suddenly uh, a, a, a shaft of ambition. There wasn't. There was a poverty ambition. England kicked everything away uh, to the extent I think they they were in the South African twenty two for about seven minutes. Um, now. England's game was predic England's game plan was about one thing only winning. Wasn't about and Steve Borthwick will always say it's not a beauty contact, and he kept saying when England played poorly, and there was a a, a, a bit of a frisson between uh, media and the team. He kept saying we won. Well, that's absolutely fine. But if you play with no ambition, a great game plan, yes. But if you play with no ambition at all, you kick everything away. And you lose. You can't turn around then and say we almost won. You didn't win. If your game plan means it, there, if entertainment has no role to play in it, and I'm not saying it does in a semi-final, but if that is the essence of what you believe, you cannot turn around and say we almost won because it's win or bust. And in the end, brave as England were, they bust. I mean, I, uh, yesterday night I watched the game again and I was amazed how hard England played, but I was also amazed how limited their game plan. And they, they were almost delighted to play that way. And like I say, you know, once you start to go down that avenue and all that matters is result, not performance, then people like me are going to say, don't care that you lost 16-15, you lost. That's the theory behind England's mentality. So they can't expect people like me to turn around when you've watched the, the South Africa game three times like I've done now and say, actually, it's ugly. I mean, and they love. yeah, I mean, you've got a point there. It was still a thrilling game, though. Come on, Stuart. I know you were very, yeah. amb you were amb very ambitious as a player, and we love that, and we want to see England play running, attacking rugby. But uh, it was still a hell of a test match, wasn't it? Nick, it was a hell of a semi-final. It would not have been a hell of a test match if it was played on a three-match tour in South Africa. The do you Lions think he's Borthwick just trying to make do with with maybe not exactly the best resources in, in terms of playing talent? No, I, I don't accept that. I think coaches have to work with what they've got. Uh, you know, Wayne Smith, when he had Marnonu, Marnonu was a, 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 a crash ball guy with the hint of fast feet didn't do much else. Wayne, Wayne Smith took him away for a long time out of season and all he did was work on his kicking game and he came back and Manonu in 2015 was unarguably the, 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 the best player in the world. Dan Carter got player of the tournament. Carter said, this bloke outside me. And that's because the coaches actually got hold of their players and they said, right, you can do this brilliantly, but you can't do that. Let's make you good at it. And I, I'm really sorry that, you know, England might not have a vintage crop, but that's because the culture of our coaching, perhaps at club level, but also international level, we just go, well, he's not very good at that. And, and a lot of players then get discounted. You actually say he's not good at that, but he's brilliant at this. So let's make him really good at that. And then we've got a fantastic player. So I, I can't buy that sort of poor resources thing. If England do have poor resources, one of the reasons is, in the last four or five years, and Borthwick was an assistant coach and he's been coached for a year, uh, England haven't sought to maximise what they have. South Africa, in contrast, have. And would you say that England had the best of the early exchanges? I mean, under the high ball, in the line-out, those rucks. I mean, I think oh. England were a better team in the first half. South Africa were rattled, England, made a lot of changes. I think, I think England were, were a better team for the majority of, of the match. I thought, and, and I wrote, I thought England's game plan was nigh immaculate in the first 10 minutes. I mean, if I'd have been Steve Forthwick coaching a team, don't get me wrong, I'd have thought in those conditions, this is how our only hope of beating South Africa. And I might have done that. Um, but I'd like to think that 
in the build up to it, you'd actually have it, it had, you, you would have examined what else you could do. England couldn't play any other game in that final, no matter what the conditions, because every time England have used their backs, it's been a, a, a sporting catastrophe. They've been hopeless. So, and so England have stopped and they've been hopeless because nobody's worked with them and no one said, look, we might need, like Jason Robinson in 2003, a moment to win a game. And England have just given up on that. They gave up on that and, and they resorted to the 10-man rugby that they wanted to play. And, and it was it was superb, but they lost. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're quite good as a nation at, at, at loving ourselves when, when we're heroic, but come out on the wrong side of the argument you know it makes us feel good about ourselves but the reality is England set out to win that game and they didn't win that game and I'm not going to turn around and say blimey here's a team that didn't do anything with their backs for an entire year the backs backs haven't scored for I don't think the back has scored for six matches now tell me that is a team that is rounded and merits being in the World Cup Let, let's be honest England were in a poor pool. They played poor rugby. Um, they beat Fiji by six points. And much as we love Fiji, Fiji are, are not an equivalent to France. So uh, as a rugby person, um, I think it's in the interest of the game that New Zealand and South Africa are two of the finalists. If it had been France and Ireland, I'd have been delighted. Um, England, on the basis of one brilliant game plan, uh, one incredibly fortuitous set of weather circumstances um, had a great day. But I'll reiterate, had that not been a World Cup semi-final, had that been a, a match in South Africa or in autumn at Twickenham, we'd have said, God, that was awful. Owen Farrell, pretty good in the last couple of games. How would you rate his performance? Uh, Owen Farrell kicked very well, but what else happened? And again, in, in the last game... It wasn't a day to run the ball. Uh, but Owen Farrell's a fly half. Uh, his goal kicking and the drop kick were immaculate. Um, I thought he played pretty well in in the Fijian game. I thought he played pretty well in the uh, South African game. But if you're a fly half, you also have to look at what's happening around you, what's happening outside you. Um, it's very hard for Alex Mitchell to make a break because Owen Farrell doesn't have that individual running threat. Is one of the reasons why England find it so hard to create anything behind the scrum uh, because uh, Farrell is too comfortable playing this limited game plan. These are questions that have to be asked. Him scoring 15 points and a load against Fiji does not answer it. It says that he played very well in the game that he is comfortable with at that highest of levels. And in the end, you know, I come back to it, England lost. And if you were in charge, Stuart, how would you have got England to try and turn the screw on South Africa in the second half? Oh, A, it's a horrible thought, me being in charge. <laughs> B, it, the key to me is the first half, when England had real control and they didn't try and turn that control into tries at all. They were very happy to go 3, 6, 9, 12, and with the drop goal, 15. Uh, but in a game that was always going to be low scoring, there comes a moment when you just say, when are we going for it? Be it a kick to the corner instead of three points. When are we going for it? Because I would have said, you know, we might need, we're going to need 20 points. 15 is probably not enough because there's a great chance that a team as good as South Africa will somehow um, score a try. And a team that is as dogged as South Africa will find their way back into it. So I was saying in the first half, uh, England, perhaps instead of just going for goal every time, uh, maybe at 9-3 should have said, let's go for the corner. Um, second half, you just hang on to your hats. They brought on um, changes. Their scrum caused England no end of problems. Uh, of that, there's no doubt. And they, but you know, they almost got there. And and I, what I'd say is, for all the South African scrum dominance, um, had England had another three five points lead, I think they'd have won the game. And we didn't have the 
uh, desire, the confidence, the um, game plan to say we must get a try when we're ahead. Let's turn. Let's turn. If fifteen six with twenty minutes to go had been, let's add another four points instead of three. Had that been nineteen six, that's game England. Yeah. Well, big ifs. Um, Stuart, that Tom Curry incident. Obviously, a lot of people talking about it. With Mbonami, yeah. if if it did happen, if that's true what he's he's alleging, it would have been a red card and it would have changed the game. Should that referee have taken the on pitch complaint more seriously? Um, yes, um, but I think it's a tricky dilemma. I think when you're in a tricky dilemma, then good refereeing is is not to be knee jerk. I, I think. Ben O'Keefe, uh, I think Ben O'Keefe got it right. I, I think where the Bonambi's, Mbana- uh, where it counts is what happens afterwards. The decision on uh, what he said, it's one of those things. I don't think it's a red card on the pitch. I think it's uh, a major talking point of it. And I found it difficult. But what, what I would say is, People are equating it and just you know, just about everyone, all the papers and television, if Curry had said that to Mbanambi, he'd have been off straight away. But it is not the same. You know, um, the South African hooker uh, comes from a race that has been the victim of apartheid. Uh, Tom Curry comes from the white race that has benefited from apartheid and I think you just can't take history out of the equations and I am not defending the South African hooker what he said was appalling but the one is not exactly the same as the other Uh, and you know Tom Curry himself I think said I don't want any more said about it Um, I'm not defending it You, you can't have that that is wrong but the one is not equated with the other and I just get a little bit squeamish when when we say, uh, what's the difference? There's a bloody big difference. And I don't think I got much more to say on that. But, you know, I was a very keen advocate of the African National Congress. And, and I didn't tour South Africa because of things that were going on. And rugby did. And rugby has supported uh, the wrong side in South Africa for a great deal of time. And I feel very squeamish saying what uh, the South African hooker said is identical to what uh, Tom Curry would have said. And Tom Curry didn't say it, and I'm sure he wouldn't, and he's a good bloke. Um, But they're not the same. All right, well said, Stuart. And and going forward, let's just look at England. Courtney Law's calling time on his international career. we got Joe Marler, Dan Cole, obviously. Uh, Danny Kerr as well might also exit uh, the out the outdoor as well. Um, we're looking at a younger side in the third place player for against Argentina. Is there a springboard England can build from? You've criticised them quite a bit, but do they have, you know, a brighter future ahead under Borthwick? Well, that's up to Steve Borthwick and his management. Do England have players? Yeah, they do. Uh, will England treat this as the launch pad or will they say, we win this one, we can say we're the third best team in the world. They're not the third best team in the world. They got to the semi-finals, but they're not the third best team in the world. They'd be Argentina. What they can do is use this as an opportunity to try and win the game. And of course they want to win the game. But in the same instant, they can also expand the bound. They can start to actually admit there are boundaries in a game of rugby. And you have to push towards them. That's what South Africa have done for two years and that's what France and Ireland have done for three years. And England have have got to start doing that. And that that means, um, for example, uh, Henry Arundel should be an automatic... And it might be that, well as Freddie Stewart played, Henry Arundel should play in his best position and his most familiar position a full back and start to see, here's a guy who's got something... Different. So the Jason special. Robinson no, moment you're talking about. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying let's get hold of him early. Jason Robinson, when he came from league to union, 
it's quite a, it, it, it's a big gulf between the two. And, and I was critical of Clive Woodward when he picked him for the England squad, saying he's not ready yet. But what Woodward understood is sometimes you've got to accelerate and fast track. And, and, and Clive Woodward got that absolutely spot on and the rest of us, a lot of us, got it wrong. Um, Arundel, I know Chile are uh, probably one of the weakest teams in the tournament, but he's just one of those blokes who stardust can stick to him. I, I saw a try he scored last year for London Irish as a 19-year-old. Challenge Cup in Toulon, one of the nastiest, hairiest, most horrible places to play in France. And it's the best individual try I have seen in donkey's years. To score a try like that against Toulon is the mark of something special. And 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 it reminded me of Jerry Guscott, who we all knew at Bath had this, I don't like X factor, but this, this something special. And England picked him. They took him to Romania. He got a hat trick. Um, Romania weren't very good. Uh, but Ian McGeekin thought, OK, they, they, they weren't special, but this bloke's got that something. He took him to Australia. He ended up with the Lions playing in the second test, scored a try to win the second test, um, had a massive role in winning the series. That's the sort of vision that you've got to have. And I keep hearing about England have, they study data, they uh, microscopically look at everything that's been, but a vision is something into the future. And I see Argentina as England's first step into the future. And if Arundel plays and England loosen up, and if their back play isn't great, I'm not going to criticise them for the back play on the day. I would criticise them for saying they just haven't been prepared for this. But I think the most important thing for England to do is go out with the right mindset, play some of the younger players, not for the sake of it, but young players who you think really can have a major impact. And if Steve can do that, then England can use the end of 23 as a launch pad to 27. And I will be delighted because I would like nothing more than for England to get going, just to, to start looking to win their next match, but not just win the game. Also think about the future. And I think we gave up on the future in our obsession with what's coming up in a week's time, both in the Six Nations, the Autumn Internationals and the World Cup. And just finally, before we go, on the final itself, you're tipping New Zealand. Is this final going to be the old, you know, power versus running rugby, or is there a bit more nuance to it than that? A, I, I said New Zealand should be favourites, and I sort of fancy them, but I'm going to stick. Um, I'm going to stick with the theory that New Zealand uh, can be rattled, and they've had their one great game. I understand why they're favourites, I think they should be favourites. Um, but I'm going to bank on South Africa to have enough power, as they showed in the first 15 minutes when they overwhelmed New Zealand at Twickenham, and uh, brilliance behind a scrum. Um, it's one of those things. I, I'm not going to say I think. I'm certain that uh, South Africa will win, or I think New Zealand will win. I think it's going to be very close. The the, the truth is, Nick, I, I I don't have a clue, but I just have a little hunch that New Zealand perhaps perhaps will just be driven backwards, won't get the turnovers against the Springboks, and South Africa uh, as underdogs will win that. But I, I I'm going to Paris um, with. I'm not thinking. I want. I'm, I'm not even thinking who's going to win that. I think it, it's it's. It's a thought. It, 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 it's it's a waste of time. You know, there's there's either team can win this match. New Zealand look as if they should, but I'm going to stick with South Africa. Last last four years ago, I spent the entire 20, 2019 saying I think the box will win. I then saw England be brilliant against um, New Zealand. I saw South Africa scramble against Japan in the quarters, scramble against Wales in the semi. And I switched. I'm not going to switch this time. That's probably when all is said and done. Sometimes you learn lessons. So why are you going for South Africa? Because four years ago, I fancied them. And at the last minute, I changed my mind. So I'm going to stick Nick with the box. Right, Stuart, predictions are a mugs game anyway. And on that bombshell, yeah. enjoy Paris. And we'll all uh, enjoy a couple more games in this fantastic Rugby World Cup this weekend. Great to chat. Pleasure, Nick. Thank you.
Thanks so much to the England great Stuart Barnes. You can get his writings and all the other Times correspondence in the paper and on the app throughout the tournament. Stig Abel will be back in the chair next week to dissect the final. Thanks very much.